Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, May the 8th. I'd like to start by thanking the volunteer crew and Shaw staff that makes the program happen every couple of weeks. My first guest is John Farquharson. We're going to be talking about a few things, but uh, we'll start with the SNC-Lavalin and Jody Wilson-Raybo situation, if I can call it that. Sure. And I was going to say something. You were going to say okay. it was on your mind. If we look at what the impact is of that whole incident, the impact, and now it's gone, it's out of the news, it's kind of, you know, it's finished at the moment. The impact seems to have been to uh, lower the Liberal Party out of uh, probably winning a majority government, and now the Conservative Party is ahead. And I wonder if that was perhaps the entire reason for the whole episode to have taken place. Because I haven't understood from the beginning why the media made such a big story out of this. Because I think, and maybe I'm completely wrong, but I think what happened in this case is exactly the way things work in Canada every day of the year and have for decades. The prime minister runs the show. If any cabinet minister dares to say no to the prime minister, they're removed and they can go to the media and the media will completely ignore them. But in this case they didn't and, and the media pretended they were concerned about what was right and what was just and democracy. But I can't believe the media has any interest in any of that. So I've been wondering from the beginning why this was such a big issue. And if we look at what the impact was, I think well maybe that was the reason for doing it. Just to cause a little bit of chaos in the country and uh, make the election a horse race maybe bring in a conservative government? Well, as you say, it doesn't look like it's going to be a horse race. It looks more like, uh, you know, it'll be uh, more likely uh, a minority government or a possibly a conservative majority government. And as to what, you know, what elements were there that made this particular story so uh, newsworthy, I mean, look at it, Jack. I mean, you've got, look at all the elements. You've got, you've got conflict, you've got drama, you've got uh, Canada's first Indigenous, uh, um, you know, attorney, uh, Minister of Justice, Attorney General, and you've got uh, a breaking. You've got, you know, sort of some sort of deep throat leaking stories to the Globe and Mail, and uh, you know, well, what you know, what more could you ask for in terms of all of the elements well, that are in one. play? About a year before this, or maybe a little longer than a year before this, the Trudeau government approved the sale of genetically modified salmon in Canada. Um, Canada became the first country in the world to allow the sale of a genetically modified animal okay. to, to the public. We became the guinea pigs for this whole thing. I'm sure all the elements that you mentioned were there with the GMO salmon as well, but there wasn't a word in the media. They completely hid the story. Most people today still don't know that we have genetically yeah, the modified salmon. The elements salmon. weren't there. Yeah. I mean, you know, okay. you, you, I don't think the elements were there. I mean, again, look at what you've got in play here. It's absolutely, you know, it's, it's like it, the, the news media love this kind of stuff. And they went after it. And they went after it big time. And I thought that Jody just played the press magnificently. And she, she loved the press. I mean, you know, you couldn't, you know, you could. You <laughs> Can we mention that you're a strong liberal supporter? I'm, I'm a very strong liberal supporter, and I've been through a lot in terms of really reflecting on, uh, you know, uh, what I expect from a political party, what I expect from a minister of justice, what I expect from, a, you know, from an attorney general. And uh, when I first heard, you know, Jody Wilson Raybould speak, I was, you know, I was like, uh, it, it was awful. It was, right? That was it. I did a little internal poll at one of our liberal gatherings and said, could you in good conscience um, go out and knock on doors and say, vote for Justin Trudeau tomorrow? And a lot of uh, the veteran door knockers said, no, I couldn't. But as people became more aware of what a deferred uh, prosecution agreement is, and as they became more aware of uh, the split between wearing a partisan hat of the Minister of Justice and a nonpartisan hat of the, the Attorney General, and they became more aware of of, uh, of Jody Wilson Rebolt's sort of philosophical orientation. Uh, then I think people being oh, they began to have a, a you know a different understanding than what was initially presented. For me, at the end of the time, you know, I mean, 
she was misplaced in that particular uh, position. She philosophically was put in an untenable position because, you know, she's a bit of a dogmatist and you have to be the ultimate pragmatist to operate with a dual hat on and then get thrown this deferred prosecution agreement. You have to be the consummate, consummate pragmatist and she isn't. So. <laughs> I'll stick with what I think, but who knows? You know, it's, 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 it's what, what bothers me from the story is that it, it, like so many other stories, it disappears and no change is made. To me, the real issue is, should the Prime Minister have so much power, right? The, the right to basically remove a cabinet minister and the right to essentially toss somebody out of the, out of the caucus. And those are the issues I think we have to look yeah. at. And it, I wish we would, because they're very Im fundamentally important issues. They are fundamentally important to look at. And apparently in terms of Commonwealth countries, in terms of the degree of concentration in the Prime Minister's office, we're up there, like on a scale of 1 to 10, in terms of concentration of power in the PMO's office, we're up there. We're like we're at an 8.5 or yeah, 9. There's nobody, almost nobody worse in terms of the concentration of power than, than Canada. Yeah, like you look at Australia. The, the Australia, the the caucus, not the caucus, the uh, cabinet uh, <laughs> turfs out. A pri I think they've been through two or three prime ministers, not by an election, but by the cabinet yeah. saying, "Hey." And Britain is very much the same. I think Britain's a lot. Well, I don't know. Anyways, but on a scale of one to yeah. ten, we're up there in terms of concentration. This is something power. we really should. Uh, it's an important issue to look at. It's an important at. issue. Okay, next. The Mayor Lisa Helps trip to the oil sands or tar sands, depending on how you like to call them. Well, she called it the oil sands. Okay. So she took to a trip to the oil sands with an open mind and then came back and the, uh, she wrote a blog post uh, about her trip and, and the uh, Times colonist dutifully transcribed her blog post and stuck it up on, into the Times colonist, you know, as an article, which I thought was a bit of <laughs> too much free media or too much earned media. Uh, but she came back and her takeaway was that there's two, uh, two paradigms operating in Canada. One paradigm was the view expressed to her by the uh, VP of, uh, of one of the, of the oil company that she visited, Senovus, I think. And, he, and she asked him point blank, she said to the VP, she said, what plans do you have to transition, uh, as an energy company, what plans do you have to transition from carbon intensive to, to renewables? And he said, we don't have that. We don't have any plan to transition. That's not in our business model. So she put that up as one paradigm, right? Boom, full tilt boogie on, uh, uh, on uh, carbon-based fuel and no plans to transition. Whereas the mayor's paradigm is uh, basically to transition to 100% uh, renewables by 2050. And her, as she acknowledged, she said, the problem with that is you have two competing paradigms. And then, what we do, and, and then what people do is they go to the edge of their paradigms and throw rocks at one another. Uh, and that's not, that's not a good way forward. And I said, well, you know, there's a, there's a third paradigm out there that bridges the gap and reduces the rock throwing. And it's a paradigm that is certainly based on the belief of the need to transition to, uh, to renewables uh, and do it in an economically responsible way. So you're doing both and. Different paradigm, but solves the problem, gets rid of the think, gap between them. I think them. part of the gap between is a created gap. I've watched the media and the, the, the oil industry and the people who run our country, the banks, big oil, you know, whoever they are, I think they've deliberately created a fight, for example, between BC and Alberta. There, there should be no fight between the people of BC and the people of Alberta. We're all in this together. Uh, we want to save the future for the next generations. To me, that's, that's the issue. The, the fight has been, we've been told the fight is about jobs, jobs in Alberta versus protecting the environment in BC. But what's never mentioned in the media, or almost never mentioned, is the fact that the Alberta Federation of Labor opposed the Kinder Morgan pipeline because they said it was bad for jobs. So if that's true, and it is, then why are we fighting each other? You know, uh, to me, it's a contrived fight, and it's vicious for, for the corporate media and our politicians to create a fight between the people of Canada for the benefit of the oil industry shows just where our country has, has gone. 
Well, I think it's, you know, the propensity for leaders, you know, like, like Mayor Helps and others, right, to work in an either or, uh, from, work from an either or perspective. Either it's this paradigm or this paradigm. I'm of the school of thought, we do both and. We both transition, we do two things. We transition away from uh, carbon-based fuels towards renewables, and we do it. It's not an either or issue, it's a both and issue. That would solve the conflict. Yes, I, I think there are definitely great and many solutions for the conflict, and I wish we could do them. Last thing, we've only got a short time left. Uh, you wanted to talk a little bit about the Nanaimo by-election, which uh, happened just a couple of days ago, but when you're watching this, it's going to be a week and a half ago. Um, and the, the Green Party won a federal seat. Yeah, they doubled their seats in, uh, in Parliament. Well, yeah, they doubled their seats in Parliament, but if we had proportional representation, they would already probably have had 30 seats. Yeah, but as we discussed earlier, the third attempt at PR in BC failed, what was it, six months ago, eight months ago, whatever it was. And so we I, don't think, <laughs> I think it failed because the power structure absolutely will never allow PR if they can stop it because it is more democratic and they don't want that. Well, it was pointed so out with who, who, the guy who won it, Manley. Yes. Paul right? Manley. And he won it with 37, no, 37% of the vote. So, uh, you know, 63% of the people in Nanaimo voted against him. Yes. So he's going to sit in the parliament right. without 50%. So what you're saying is this is called preferential ballot. Yeah. And preferential ballot means that in all of our elections where we elect somebody, they should have to have 50% of the vote. And that's very, very easy to do. I don't know why we haven't done it. I mean, let's do it. Let's do but it. But let's do it within a proportional system because if you don't have proportionality, you're really losing a lot. But I'm completely in agreement with you. So in Nanaimo, what would have happened is the first round would have been Paul Manley ahead with 37%. Yeah, then it would have. Then and would. the bottom person on the poll would have dropped out. And the there, the, the, what's it called? People's, People's Party of Canada yeah, would okay. have been gone. That's first two round. or three percent of the vote would have gone somewhere. And then a recount, and then the last person drops off again, which would have been probably the NDP, let's say, of the major parties, and their votes would have gone somewhere. And then you end up with somebody having to get 50% plus yeah. one of the vote, which makes only makes sense. It gives that person a, an incredible degree of legitimacy that they don't have in terms of going forward from their riding and saying, I represent the voice of 50% plus one of the people in my riding. I try to do them all, but I'm, I'm here because 50% plus one voted for me. I don't know if any of our politicians have any legitimacy anymore. I mean. <laughs> But maybe that's another story that's for another, another story. day. Yeah, because they don't represent us. You know, they they we, even if sixty percent of us elect them, they go off and they do what they're told by the well, party some, leadership. Some do, some don't. Well, if you don't, you're gone. Okay, um, which is where this conversation started. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, John, thank you very much. You know, John and I, I think we we disagree on all the small stuff, but I think we completely agree on the big stuff, which is that we want a, a we're good to go. and better. We both agree that. Climate change is an existential threat, and we yeah. have to deal with it. And we both want better communities yep. and all of that. So How we get there, that's the How difference. do we get there, yeah. Thank you, John. My pleasure, thanks. And Appreciate it. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. <laughs>